Hello. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, welcome to this session on innovation, uh, technology, medicine. As a health journalist, a health editor, I can say from personal experience, this is an incredibly inspiring time to be discussing the future of healthcare. Um, the technological revolution that's underway has the potential to both drive a more personalized and accurate and smarter medicine, um, but also to expand our ability to care for people around the planet. And the troves of data that we're collecting can really only be tapped with technologies like AI and machine learning and all the technologies you're hearing about every day. And so we sort of stand on the cusp of being able to access um, all that knowledge in a new way. Challenges remain. Um, so along with all the excitement becomes difficulties, risks, um, and the potential for getting things wrong. But today we have an exceptional panel, and I know they're both going to inspire us, hopefully you and also me, with the promise of what's possible, but also to discuss the practicalities. So um, I'd like you to basically welcome, first of all, to my left, we have Molly Stevens, the John Black Professor of Bio Nanoscience at the University of Oxford. Next to her is Cosima Greton, Director of Clinical Feedback at Our Future Health. Uh, next to her is Jack, Dr. Jack Kreindler, um, who is the founder and medical director of the Center for Health and Human Performance. And at the end, last but by no means least, we have uh, Chris Wigley, who is the CEO of Genomics England. Um, please welcome our guests, and Molly, you have the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. My lab works on new technologies to diagnose diseases earlier, treat diseases better, and we're also looking to make those treatments as accessible as possible. Technology can massively impact healthcare. So advances in materials engineering, data science, AI, uh, more moves towards personalized medicine are all, all helping uh, us be able to uh, detect diseases earlier, treat diseases better, but also prevent potentially diseases. And there's more and more of a focus on um, essentially wellness, so trying to make people stay healthy and longer. So, so if we think about early detection of um, diseases, this is important for pretty much every disease you can think of, whether it's detecting that you've had a heart attack earlier so that you can intervene, or perhaps detecting a cancer earlier, or indeed uh, looking into antimicrobial uh, resistance detection and also infectious disease detection and helping to contain the spread of infectious disease. So early detection is, is really, really important. And technologies that can help with that are going to play a key role in society and are already playing a key role in society. If we look just at the very humble lateral flow test, so you've all become familiar with this during the uh, COVID pandemic and, and maybe before. Well, this is a technology that actually contains nanoparticles. And it contains nano-sized particles of gold. And because the gold is at the nanoscale, it actually appears red to our eye. And so that test line that you can see on those COVID tests is actually aggregates of very, very small gold nanoparticles. And it's worth thinking about uh, nanoparticles and, and trying to really visualize how small they are because they're actually really, really, really tiny. So if you take the size of the sun and you shrink it down to a football and then you shrink that football down by the same amount again, then you're at the nano scale. So we're talking about very, very small particles, but that can have really massive effects. So both within diagnostics, but also as advanced vaccines and other kinds of advanced therapies. Now, now if we take those gold nanoparticles, for example, that are within the COVID test, wouldn't it be great if we could make those tests even more sensitive so that you could detect diseases even earlier? And this is the sort of thing that we've been doing in our lab. So what you can see on the left there is a new kind of nanoparticle. So it also has gold, but it has a porous platinum shell around the edge of it. And it has a very interesting catalytic activity, and it results in a color change that is much, much stronger than what you can see with the gold particles. And this means we can use it to get much more sensitive measurements, but in a very, very cheap portable format, just like the humble lateral flow test but now it works much, much more sensitively. 
and you can adapt this for different diseases. So some of the things we're looking at are infectious disease, but also different types of cancers and cardiovascular disease. And we also want to make this kind of technology more accessible. And one of the ways we do that is by combining it with mobile phones. So everybody here will have a mobile phone. They're used, of course, for web searches and social media. Um, but they can also be used in medicine, so they can be used to help with mobile diagnostics. So being able to take point-of-care, cheap diagnostics into the field so that you can read them wherever you are. And this can really help in democratization of access to healthcare. And that sounds very noble, but it shouldn't be noble. It should be a basic human right that we're trying to democratize access to healthcare for everybody. And there's now more than 8 billion um, global mobile phone subscriptions around the world. And being able to increase the accessibility of these tests is, is really, really important. AI, of course, is playing a, a great role as well, whether that's in early diagnosis or um, looking at analytics or even robotic, new, new ways of doing robotic surgery, lots and lots of important uses for AI and the increases, increasing trends towards personalized medicine. And that's an area, actually, where 3D printing can help. So 3D printing's been around a long time now, but it's, it's no longer useful just for printing uh, trinkets and prototypes. It's actually used in a lot in real-world applications. So whether that's from aerospace to healthcare, bespoke medical implants, lots and lots of applications of 3D printing are used. And we use it in our lab as well. And I'm, I'm actually known for sort of killing uh, all of my houseplants. I can't, can't seem to keep my houseplants alive. Um, but by some miracle, people in my lab are actually able to use 3D printing to create scaffolding systems that can keep very, very small pieces of brain tissue alive. And you can make these kind of scaffolds in different ways using very precise um, 3D printing with very interesting materials, with interesting types of chemistries. And you can grow these very, very small pieces of brain-like tissue. These are called brain organoids, and you can grow them really reproducibly. And they can help us with understanding more about neuroscience and brain function and even screening of drugs. And this field of organoid um, technology is, is, is very expansive now. So, so there'll be people uh, in many groups all around the world looking at different types of organs that you can make using organoid technology. So whether that's uh, things like the, the brain applications or cardiac or liver or many, many different organs. And it goes even further. You can take this organoid technology and you can put it as a sort of human on a chip. So have many of these different organ systems interacting and talking to each other, releasing soluble uh, molecules and also uh, molecules that will um, uh, increase or decrease metabolic function of the tissues. And those kind of systems are, are really important in enabling uh, better personalized medicine, because you can use the patient's own cells, for example, and human cells to make these systems. Um, and you can combine them with a lot of um, data science as well, and so really uh, end up with a very, very informative uh, system for both drug discovery, but also learning about biology. And all of this takes a lot of teamwork. So, so within my own research group, for example, we have lots of engineers, of course, chemists, but we also have physicists, cell biologists, surgeons, all these different types of people coming together. But, but it can't be just the research group working in isolation. They also have to link up to uh, the, the medical um, experts and, and consultants and, and uh, people working within hospitals and running clinical studies and so on. And of course, all the healthcare policy and regulatory. And there's so, so many different pieces that need to, get, to come together to make um, all of this um, work. So, so, so really, to conclude, um, um, my view is technology is at a, a very, very exciting time. There's a huge amount of promising technology out there. There's, of course, things we need to consider, but we really need to aim to make the technologies as transformative as possible, whilst also making sure that they can be as accessible as we can possibly make them. Thank you. Hello, I'm going to talk to you today about one of the most exciting initiatives in the UK at the moment. <clears throat> a large research program called Our Future Health 
aiming to recruit 5 million participants over the next five years. But before I talk about our future health, I'm going to talk to you about one of the problems facing UK uh, health system today. To put it bluntly, we're all living longer than ever, but in poor health. Research has shown that 54% of people over the age of 65 live with two or more serious health conditions. And that number is set to grow to 68% by the year 2035. One of the major challenges with um, dealing with this uh, problem is that we basically can't uh, conduct basic research and translate it fast enough into practice. One of the other problems is that we have major levels of diabetes um, and cardiovascular di disease across the UK. As an example of diabetes, um, the, the NHS is due to spend about 16 billion per year on diabetes alone by the year 2033. And in fact, one in 10 people by the year 2033 will be living with diabetes. That's 5.5 million people. And cardiovascular disease is no different. For cardiovascular disease, one in four people currently live with heart and circulatory conditions in the UK. And the NHS spends 7.4 billion a year. That's nearly 10% of its budget. So what's going wrong? We understand a lot about these conditions. We really know how to treat them. Um, but we haven't managed to ac access the solutions at scale. Well, there are a number of reasons. I'm going to talk about two today uh, that our future health is trying to address. The first is um, related to the problem of translating science into practice. You've heard about some amazing innovations from Molly, but the problem is we can't get those into clinical practice. In fact, 95% of new medical technologies fail when they reach the market. In fact, it takes more than 20 tries to actually have one success. Researchers call this the valley of death. Um, and we've also obviously had advances in AI and machine learning, which are fantastic. They've transformed basic science. They've enabled us to discover new drugs and new biomarkers, but they still can't get those drugs and biomarkers through clinical trials. And the reason for this is that clinical trials are expensive. It takes many years to develop the safety and efficacy data, but also human biology is very unpredictable. We still just don't know a lot about how the body works. The second problem with healthcare today is health equality. In fact, health inequalities are everywhere. I'll give you two examples. We've known for 50 years that first-generation South Asians have a 50% increased risk of cardiovascular disease compared to the white European population in the UK. We also know that the 10% of the most deprived in the UK are almost twice as likely to die from cardiovascular disease than those in the 10% of the least deprived. So what's going wrong? Well, we also understand um, one of the problems is that although it's both about the health research being translated in practice, but it's also about inequalities in the underlying health research. In fact, uh, a systematic review of the UK's COVID-19 trials uh, found that most ethnic groups, apart from white British, were underrepresented in the data compared to data from the Office for National Statistics. And that gap was most marked among black and Asian groups. So how is our future health attempting to address this? So it's a giant program in partnership with the NHS. And we're dedicated to enabling researchers to conduct studies to discover and test new ways to predict, prevent, and treat diseases. Diseases, common diseases like cardiovascular disease, heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. We're collecting and linking millions of, 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 our, of pieces of health data, both genetic, environmental, lifestyle uh, data, across a cohort of five million adult volunteers that truly reflect the UK's diversity. And by building that 
very detailed picture of the nation's health, we hope to accelerate translational health research and ensure that those new discoveries benefit everybody. It's an ambitious goal, um, but we're really lucky to be doing it here in the UK because in the UK we have not only been at the forefront of genomics, but we have a diverse multi-ethnic population and we have a healthcare system that looks after people from cradle to grave. In fact, we're building on the legacy of, of studies uh, like UK Biobank, which recruited 500,000 participants and the 100,000 Genomes Study. And we're going to build on that and increase in scale and diversity to ensure these discoveries benefit everybody. So what happens? Well, when you sign up, um, participants will uh, conduct a, uh, take, take part in an online questionnaire and then attend an appointment where um, they give a, a couple of small blood samples and a height, weight, um, blood pressure, body mass index measurements and a cholesterol. And that, uh, those blood samples go to a lab where they're genotyped on a custom Illumina array. And that array has 700,000 genetic variants. The array is optimized for the UK population and contains single nucleotide polymorphisms that detect common diseases like cancer and diabetes uh, and also predict blood type and predict uh, response to your genetic response to some drugs. After that, we store the biological sample um, that, that isn't used uh, for onward use by researchers in further studies. Participants also consent for us to link their NHS data, so that's primary care, secondary care, uh, cancer registry data, to build a really rich picture of long-term health outcomes for research. So for researchers, it's going to be really transformative. We're basically building a prospective observational data set of five million people um, with the opportunity to retest the blood sample. Uh, we're also enabling um, recontact studies for, for, for participants so that they can continue to take part in research that is tailored to their risk of certain diseases. And that could be anything from just a single another sample to a randomized controlled trial. Finally, we're offering participants feedback on their risk of certain diseases. Um, and so this will be based on a personalized risk assessment based on genetic, lifestyle, and other health data. And this will enable greater insight into their health, but also enable us to study how these uh, new types of health data can be used to predict and prevent diseases. Our future health will be an absolutely transformative research program, the scale, the diversity, and the opportunity to recall participants based on their risk will transform healthcare and enable researchers to build, bridge that translation gap, that valley of death, and also enable us to uh, conduct research that applies and benefits everyone. So time is running out, and uh, you can actually sign up today. Um, we have been recruiting for eight months, and we have, um, we have been recruiting for eight months. We have 800,000 volunteers already. Um, and if you are excited about a future of healthcare that is both predictive, predictive, preventative, and precise, then sign up today at ourfuturehealth.org.uk and let's help people live healthier lives for longer. Thank you. Billions of years ago, a hyper-intelligent race of pan-dimensional beings got fed up knowing all there was to know about the universe, and so they built a stupendously powerful supercomputer, <laughs> put all the data and knowledge that they could find into it, and it spent 6.8 million years coming up with the ultimate answer to life, the universe, and everything, which was, of course... 42. Cor correct, a cultured, a cultured audience, a cultured panel. Um, of course, this was uh, the brainchild of the late great Douglas Adams wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I actually worked for Douglas whilst I was still a medical student and learned a lot of what there was to know about where technology was going to take us. But in terms of understanding where it would apply to medicine, I'm actually going to go back in time to a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Darth Vader, for me, is the pinnacle of the future of medical technology. And let me explain why. Vader had 100% burns. 
He had terrible internal medical issues. No arms and no legs. Some psychological issues. Some minor problems, and of course... which was never formally diagnosed, but it was one of the two. Um, so for me, uh, Vader represents the future of medical technology and has been a huge driving force between, for me to apply technology to medical practice. My practice is that of extreme environments, medicine and human performance science. We work with uh, famous athletes. We work with celebrities. We do a lot of extreme challenges. We work with people in other kinds of extreme environments, like founders. Uh, we do charity challenges, taking people to vast extremes, and we do a lot of science, some of which is really rather silly, like this is me being put in a cage fight with Nick the Headhunter Chapman, 107 kilo cage fighter. Uh, I lost. Um, but we wanted to test whether rest, ice, compression, and elevation actually had an effect on healing in tissues. And we also do very serious stuff, working with cancer patients and understanding who's going to survive in ICU or not. And we do this with data. And technology is required to get those data, and we collect an awful lot of data, much more than you typically find in a normal ward round. We can, with those data, project and predict when it is likely that people will end up coming to their demise, notwithstanding being injured or getting hit by cancer. And we do this all the time, of course, to keep things safe, like you know, in the aviation industry, where a typical Airbus A350 on a transatlantic flight will produce about 100 million pages of paper in terms of if you were to print it out in a report. You couldn't get through that in a ward round. And in fact, the aviation industry produces 300 million, billion pages of data per second. That is why it is a safe kind of thing to get into an airplane, less so going into a hospital. State of the art when I was born, height and weight every year, which begs the question, as to whether you would get into an airplane if you hadn't checked it properly after 50 years. Okay, we wouldn't. It goes to show that actually if you look at the, the reliability and safety of medicine, it's actually not a very reliable or safe uh, environment to be in. In 2012, uh, I was invited by Daniel Kraft, who will be appearing on stage here later, to Singularity University's Exponential Medicine program, where we started to learn all about these cool devices that you could start to wear and could collect data about you. And we did some experiments and started to be able to tell when people were going to go into hospital days in advance of them doing it. We applied this to celebrities like Alan Shearer and Robbie Savage to see when they were hopping around, jumping on, to, on, sitting on every seat in Wembley Stadium, which one would win by being able to analyze their data in real time. And these are devices that would have cost 10,000 pounds per hour about 20 years ago and now cost a dollar a day and obviously do have their disadvantages as well when you want to peel them off. And we need to use these data because we need more data to be able to understand how to unpick the complexities of biology and the diseases of aging. Biology is complex, and once we've even gotten around those problems, we've got the complexity of health systems. And we need to be able to prove to the stakeholders and the payers where it is we should be spending money and, and why these data are important. And if it's not for that, then we have to prove things to the politicians as well. We're not going to completely solve everything in the short term. And we shouldn't worry too much about not being able to solve those things immediately. And we also have to be grateful for some things that were difficult as well recently. COVID did change a lot because it started to put some of these technologies into our own hands when previously they were only really used in research. I'll give an example of something that we were involved with at Imperial College which was reopening large events by getting people to test things at home on their own, such as the, their, uh, lateral, uh, their, their uh, COVID tests uh, for sending to a lab for PCRs, and learning that actually people taught to take tests on their own could perform as well, if not better, than professionals uh, in the quality of their, of their sampling. This is remarkable, and published a bunch of papers around this and started to sort of postulate as to whether we were entering a Skype moment for diagnostics, which I think we can all agree we are now entering. After COVID, um, two really brilliant people, Professor Chris Imray and uh, Major Natalie Taylor, both doctors, 
and extreme environments um, medics like myself, proposed that we would design the world's most extreme clinical trial and take some of these technologies from the normal environment, like here, to the harshest environment on Earth to try to cross Antarctica and to see why it was, perhaps, that women outperform men in hyperendurance environments and see physiologically and biochemically why that was the case. Um, we, designed the, we designed this as part of the third of three trials, two of which had happened in the past, head-to-head -head looking at men versus women, arming us with various devices that you can buy in the shops today. We also did some quite clever stuff before and after in the laboratories so that we could see what biomarkers and genes would be modulated. And we came up with some extremely brilliant results that we, were, that we will publish. But in order to give you a flavor of how we can use technology in these extreme environments and why they become relevant to us, um, not just at the South Pole, but in our everyday lives and clinics, I'm going to play you a little bit from one of the sponsor's videos. Um, let's see if you like it. We're getting ready to get going and date to the expedition. We'll see you when the day breaks. Take a moment to reflect on the seeming infinity of the polar plateau. So Jack, can you tell us about the science that's going on with Inspire 22? This is a seven-day scientific experiment recording a lot of biometric data from the 10 of us who are um, skiing the last degree to the South Pole. One of the key things which we're trying to see is why is it that women appear to maintain their muscle mass more than men in extremely austere environments like this. Fabrice is one of our subjects. Let's scan Fabrice. Start up. That would have been good to have started this before, wouldn't it? <laughs> this is what editing is for. <laughs> ah, right, right. Scan complete. Oh my goodness me. Check that out. This is the glucose of somebody that is really fit and burning fuel brilliantly. Now it's time to eat and refuel. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let you guys look up on the internet. You can look up Inspire 22 and see, the, uh, see more of the footage. What's important from this is we learned an awful lot of clinical grade information data from very, very simple devices which today are available to us all and producing research grade insights that are helping us change the way we practice, perhaps the way that we fuel people when they're in very sick, when they're very sick or in difficult situations in ICU. But what's more important from this is another learning and that is that it was a very, very, very hard thing we put ourselves through. You can see the kind of data on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side there. There's lots of red there. It was pretty arduous, and very, we were very sleep-deprived. People were crying. There were some crises. There were problems. People even became unconscious from hypoglycemia, and we detected this after, afterwards using continuous glucose monitors that you can buy today in the shops. And yet, having said that, all in all, the experience of the people in these ultra-extreme environments, very similar to going through difficult times in, meds, in medical situations, was overwhelmingly positive. The green shows the positive affect. The red shows how the negative feelings. It was a great thing to do. And why is that? It's because it is not just technology that we need to solve problems and the creativity that we need to apply them to difficult things. We also need to use these technologies to make us persist and get through some of these difficult challenges that sometimes take decades for us to solve. But more important than any of that, it's the ability for us to communicate with each other, take care of each other. It is not just the technology, it's not just the AI, it's not just large language models that come up with spurious answers to difficult questions, it's the ability for us to care better. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. So I have the privilege and uh, risk of going last. I'm going to maybe draw three themes that we've seen in some of the other talks together. The first is that things are changing really fast, and they're going to continue changing really fast. The second is that the system today has a lot of challenges. And the third is that if we are optimistic, 
the changes that we can see happening can help us address those challenges. So I'm not going to go back trillions of years to ancient civilizations. Um, I'm not going to go to a distant galaxy far, far away. Um, this is Glasgow um, about 150 years ago. Lister introduced a bunch of processes around sterilization of medical equipment between operations. So we just celebrated my mum's 80th birthday in Cambridge last weekend. And the thought really struck me, it's only her lifetime, and then her lifetime again, that surgeons were not sterilizing equipment between operations. And they would shove the scalpel into one pus-ridden body, take it out, put it into the next one. Surprise, surprise, the outcomes were truly terrible. And so by introducing these, these concepts, Lister and his team were able to revolutionize outcomes from um, surgery. If we fast forward a bit to just 100 years ago, this was insulin, which we can use to treat diabetes, to help uh, the body process sugars better. The way that we made insulin 100 years ago was to kill a bunch of dogs, uh, mash up their pancreases, um, and extract the insulin from it. Um, so that feels pretty medieval and was only really just 20 years before um, my mom was born. From 100 years ago to 75 years ago, um, the birth of the NHS, um, that dashing chap on the left is Anurin Bevan, the uh, health secretary who, uh, who brought in the NHS in um, 43, and, um, sorry, 48. Um, and he's, uh, he's chatting to one of the first patients there. Um, and this, at the time, led to a real uh, revolution in the way that healthcare was delivered in this country. Lots of people were vaccinated. There was lots of unmet need that was, um, that was met. And potentially, I'll argue, we have an, a chance to make another leap forward like that. Not long after the NHS came into existence, um, the folks on this slide, Rosalind Franklin in the middle, Crick and Watson, and their, their model on either side, discovered the structure of DNA. Crick and Watson... <coughs> Sorry. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know that we feel strongly that Rosalind Franklin was actually the discoverer of DNA. <laughs> that was the punchline. <laughs> and Crick and Watson may have uh, taken a peek at her X-ray crystallography photo. Um, a lot of people still feel very passionately about that today, <laughs> Natasha. Um, back to our friend um, insulin. It was a, about um, 50 years ago, we could synthesize insulin. Genentech did this on the West Coast rather than mashing up dog's pancreases. So these things have been changing in very rapidly in a pretty short space of time, a lifetime or two. And today, where are we? So I work at Genomics England. We have a partnership with the NHS where we provide whole genome sequencing for patients with rare diseases and with cancer. So we can take a blood sample, we can extract the DNA, sequence that, we get these 3.2 billion uh, base pairs of information, and that can tell us a huge amount about the root causes of someone's disease, the nature of their cancer tumor, um, their prognosis, what kind of therapeutics are likely to work for them, and so on. And the pace of change just keeps moving. All of the bits in green there are some of the new kind of omics which are coming on screen, transcriptomics, which is RNA, proteomics, looking at proteins, and so on. And these are coming very rapidly from the research lab into the clinic, thanks to the activities um, of all of those moving these forward. Likewise, today we can use artificial intelligence algorithms to complement uh, radiologists and pathologists in looking at um, digital images. Um, amazingly, some of the research collaborators that we work with um, can have algorithms which can just look at the pixels of a radiology image um, or a pathology image of a cell and can predict gene expression or RNA um, from that, these things seem to us to be completely unrelated, but are, are now linkable. Equally, in the field of cancer, this is a sort of um, stylized image of a cancer cell, and we can see the, um, the proteins that sit on the surface of the cell. The big question that has puzzled oncologists for millennia has been how do we differentiate between cancerous cells and non-cancerous cells? Treatments like chemotherapy just indiscriminately kill um, tons and tons of cells, hence all of the horrendous side effects from chemo. We can now sequence the cancer tumor's DNA, which is different from someone's original DNA, um, manufacture a, um, a sort of so-called vaccine that we can re-inject into someone, 
that just like the RNA vaccines for COVID trained your body to fight off uh, COVID, these train your body just to kill the cancer cells that are from your tumor. Um, so very, it's like moving from nuclear bombs to kind of sniper's rifles. Um, very, very precise um, technology. And we talk about these emerging capabilities in AI um, already today. Microsoft bought a company called Nuance for I think it was about $20 billion that um, can, with consent, listen to conversations between doctors and patients, um, write up the notes, update the electronic health records, um, and save all of that admin time for doctors, for um, clinical teams, and so on. So, if all this amazing stuff is happening, why do we still struggle um, in the healthcare systems that we have? Um, and you know, if we get real, in the UK, the waiting lists are at seven and a half million. The satisfaction levels with the NHS are at the lowest that they've been since surveys began. Um, Life expectancy, which has consistently gone up for the last kind of 80, 100 years, um, froze between 2012 and 2022, froze by two decimal places, really, really precisely stuck. Um, and increasingly, the public are expecting to have to um, pay for things which they traditionally would have expected to get um, for free. Um, the self-pay market has, has grown in this country to 32 billion pounds, almost a fifth of the NHS's budget. So patients are struggling. Doctors are also struggling. Um, even before the pandemic, there were 100,000 uh, vacancies. The incredibly tough times through the pandemic where we were clapping the carers, those carers were really um, struggling. The doctors are on strike now. Um, we need to help them. And if you're an innovator or a researcher, um, it can also feel tough to get your products into the hands of doctors to improve the lives of patients. We heard about um, you know, 19 out of 20 innovations struggle to get traction in the clinic. So it can feel that the system is quite unstable. But before we all despair too much, um, this is sort of like the second act in a rom-com, you know, where they've broken up and um, you know, everything looks, looks grim. We're getting to the third act where you know, they get together and, um, and live happily ever after. Um, but it's not so much about flying cars and um, whiz-bang um, tech. My firm belief that is if we want to get the next 10 years right in um, healthcare, all we have to do is kind of bring things that already exist into actual practice. So to go from stock photos to real life. So if we go back to patients, um, this lady is feeling great, right? And why is she feeling great? Because we can understand um, risk factors using all of the techniques that um, COS and others have talked about, like polygenic risk, risk scores. Um, looking at someone's uh, hormones, their, their genetics, um, other factors, so that we can really get ahead of um, disease. There are more and more um, both therapeutics and kind of coaching programs that help us to improve our own behavior, which is such a huge part of this. We've known for decades that smoking kills us, still a bunch of people smoke. We need to help each other with, um, with changing behavior. We, we are already moving to a more multi-channel um, system in healthcare, and I think that's, that's only going to uh, accelerate, all with the goal of expanding, not necessarily lifespan, it's not that people necessarily want to live for 200 years, but in increasing the health span so that we can have healthy and happy lives. This, I think, is a really nice image of what future health could look like in practice. If you look at that image, there are a few things that stand out um, to me. So one is, there's no one looking at a screen, the technology is invisible. This is a human-to-human -human moment. Another is that this is not in a hospital with a load of bleeping machines. It's in someone's home. The process that's happening here is promoting wellness. It's not treating sickness, so it's being preemptive, um, preventative. And this is not a gray-haired um, old dude with a stethoscope. This is a junior colleague who's been enabled by technology um, to get out there and help improve someone's health. This is a diagram that we use a lot at Genomics England, talking about how we believe that healthcare and research really have to come together in a, in a symbiotic relationship. So healthcare is obviously where the magic happens. We can, we can actually treat patients. We can also um, generate an extraordinary amount of data. We can de-identify that data and make it available to researchers who can drive forward more science, um, develop new therapeutics, develop new clinical approaches, and critically can feed those results back um, into the healthcare side. So that bringing together of healthcare and research into a learning system is absolutely critical. 
To do that, we need to focus on the fundamentals. Um, so I'm sure everyone has recognized um, Hippocrates uh, here, very handsome dude. Um, I'm not sure what the photo is that the statue was based on, but um, I'm sure it's accurate. Um, and of course, Hippocrates said, first, do no harm. Um, I would add, in terms of the foundations that we need for this brighter healthcare future, we need to fix some tech debt. I'm sure Hippocrates would agree. Um, we can't do this in hospitals and health systems that run on paper. We need to have the basic digital infrastructure in place. Um, one of his other sayings was, walking is a man's best medicine. We might say a human's best medicine today. So this concept of uh, preventative medicine, this concept of behavior change, um, was already um, a vision all the thousands of years ago that Hippocrates was um, preaching. I think we're standing at a point in history where we can um, bring that into life, and I think that's really exciting. Thank you very much. Well, um, there were some remarkable insights um, into the future there from, from some very different perspectives. And so let's uh, start talking about some practicalities. Um, if I'm the health minister of uh, an unnamed European country facing a winter health crisis and maybe an election coming up, um, and, you, and I perhaps gave you an audience with him for 20 minutes, could you summarize what you would tell him about what he needs to be thinking about in terms of investing for the future and orienting the health system for the future? Molly, I don't know if you want to start. Yeah, I, I guess I can give the perspective from uh, academia. So, so I'm an academic, but I've also founded five spin-out companies um, in areas from early diagnostics, uh, advanced therapeutics, and also some instrumentation-based um, companies. And uh, to, if, if I speak to that very particular point about getting innovation, you know, out of the the very scientific nitty-gritty arena and into society, then um, really setting up ecosystems to enable that translation to happen as, as fast as, and, and as efficiently as possible would be something I would really push for. And is that the sort of thing that Cosimo is doing, would you say, is creating that sort of ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that I think their project is, is hugely important important in terms of understanding actually the demographics within society and the sort of uh, the range of, of different characteristics that people have that would benefit from technologies. And if you had your 20 minutes with the health minister, what would you be selling? I think that um, from my perspective, we need to reinvigorate public health. We've been underfunding it, underproviding it over the last decade or so. And that is why so many, and, and with an aging population, that is why so many people have so many chronic conditions. And that is why we need so many doctors and so much money in the system. I mean, there are many, many other factors. It's very complex. But to me, I'm excited about our future health because it really is a kind of modern data-driven attempt to um, accelerate our understanding of public health interventions, seeing how we can better screen people based on genetic risk, how we can come up with new interventions that prevent things before they start, basically. Jack? Practically, I would encourage as much research into the biology of sarcopenia, of weakness as you get older. Um, that would be the one thing that if I was upgraded from health minister to treasurer, I would be the most worried about, is the fact that we are inevitably going to be overwhelmed with an ever-aging population who will fill up all our hospital beds and all of our time with just being frail. And it is, you know, one of the key things that we talk about with aging in our work uh, is how do we make you strong in your, in your latter years? Um, and that is not just for, you know, vanity's sake to look and feel good, but it's absolutely critical to our economy. So the science around um, developing a good, strong body, and that also helps the brain, um, the drugs that might help us make some interventions, but right now, the stuff that we can do immediately and start implementing immediately, it's, it's mission critical. 
Chris, I wonder if you could also I mean, reflect on, when you answer the question, reflect on the fact that there's also a sort of political dimension to this in terms of convincing someone who's in post for a short amount of time to look further ahead into the future. Your own um, institution was the sort of foresight of one prime minister who had that foresight, David Cameron. Can you also sort of maybe touch on that? Yeah, I mean, our owner, so we're a private company, but we're owned by the government. Our owner is the Secretary of State um, for Health and Social Care. I've had a few over the last, um, over the last few years. And I think that all of the ideas that my esteemed colleagues have come up with are spot on. I think that politically it would also be a bit like soccer what? And, uh, <laughs> like the, sort of, you know, without wanting to uh, denigrate the depth of their uh, medical knowledge and like ecosystem what and risk what? It's, I think that to get politicians' attention, you need to speak to very tangible things. And so I think that if we're talking about winter crisis, you could say, well, look, We've learned about how to classify pathogenic viruses very quickly using uh, sequencing the way that we identified the different variants of COVID and so on. We've learned that RNA um, vaccines really work and you can now get combo kind of COVID and flu ones. Let's get those out there. And we know that we need to keep people out of hospitals and in, in their homes. So let's get wearables out there. Let's get those sort of finger blood oxygen. You know, they cost 20 quid. As soon as someone's in hospital, it's hundreds of quid a night. As soon as someone's in ICU, it's thousands of quid a night. Um, we need to empower people, as, as Jack was saying, to test themselves, to manage themselves, to, to do this. But the, the biggest thing is keeping, keeping them out of hospital. But, with, um, but how to lift the eyes, I think, is a lot of it, for me, is about telling stories. So the biggest program we've had funded since I've been at Genomics England has been our program to offer whole genome sequencing to newborn babies, well, to offer it to the mum, who's probably a bit more switched on about these topics um, <laughs> al alongside, <laughs> alongside the standard heel prick test. So the st standard heel prick test tests for nine things. Whole genome sequencing, we can test for about 300. Um, and the way that we persuaded Treasury and the Department of Health and Social Care that this was a good idea was really by telling stories, by bringing the voices of, of mums, um, of parents who have sick kids, um, and saying that we can actually make these things better at a very hu tangible human level. And frankly, if you're a politician, you get to kiss a baby and this is all great. Um, and so I think bringing the science, the storytelling, and the kind of pragmatism together helps us to move forward. Right, so kind of innovations that are of, of immediate use, but also long-term use. Um, there's a lot of innovation going on. I get the impression that you know, there's stuff being invented all the time, and yet our capacity to assess the value of each of these different innovations and absorb them into healthcare, medical settings, and more broadly, seems to be a lot more limited, particularly with restrictions on healthcare staff. Do, do you, any of you have some good examples of uh, innovations that have been adopted relatively quickly, and why was that? What is the sort of secret source, do you think? Mm. Should we go, let's go reverse order. So, I mean, there's one, a friend of mine runs a startup, I'm not an investor, um, called uh, Euphonia. Um, and all this does, all, all that it does, is call up a patient the day before they're due to come in for an appointment and say, oh, just checking, have you, do you remember you've got an appointment tomorrow? It's at 11.30, it's in this address, and remember you need to bring your test result or whatever. Um, it's all... AI generated, it's an AI voice. The, com the conversation is very natural, it has very high um, feedback scores from patients, and it reduces missed appointments by something like 80%. And so really super, not niche, but super widespread, but specific problem in the healthcare system, missed appointments. Really nice, clean application of an existing technology to that specific problem. It's just a really nice kind of product market fit moment. And I think that there are challenges with getting innovations to stick in the healthcare system, but I think the more that innovators can really think back from what are the problems that we're trying to solve here and why and for whom, which sounds really basic, but actually answering those questions well is really tough. I think that really helps things to, to land. Anyone else? Well, um, I, I just, um, speaking from a personal viewpoint, you know, some of the things that we're doing is actually developing platform technologies so that other companies can link with us and use that technology in lots of different ways. So whether it's to deliver particular molecules or perhaps um, functionalize, functionalize the way that nanoparticles can be used to then target to different regions of the body. And then we also invented a 
machine that's the first in the world to characterize single nanoparticle chemistry. And that, that can then be used by many, many different pharma companies and many groups. So, so it's not necessarily, necessarily that technology is always one very specific project used for just one thing, but I think platform technologies as well, you know, are, are very important actually and, and can be very widespread. I think this, from, from my perspective, there are two times where you see massive accelerations. One is where inevitably advances in technology will eventually reach some kind of sudden inflection point like they did earlier this year with the launch of large language models, which was kind of expected, but we did not know exactly when it was going to happen, and it was an explosion. And there is no question that things like that will happen again and again. It happened with the discovery of uh, antiseptics, with antibiotics, with monoclonal antibodies, hard, hard, hard work, and then an explosion. They will happen. The other thing, which we will see, is when we are under extreme pressure, we work together. Mm. We absolutely changed the total paradigm and time frame in which we discovered major breakthroughs in the way we could treat COVID, serious COVID, in unimaginably fast time frames, which people like Don Berry have been saying for ages, ages and ages, decades and decades, Bayesian trials, do them, you know, like, do adaptive trials. They're much quicker than doing RC randomized control trials, A versus B. We didn't have time for A versus B. A versus B versus C versus A versus D versus Q. We figured stuff out countrywide for the world almost instantaneously. Why are we not maintaining that pressure mm. when it's not COVID? Because the problems are still here. They may not be as dramatically acute with people running, uh, queuing outside, being unable to breathe outside A&E, but they're queuing outside their GP having waited six months for an appointment. Let's keep the pressure on. I, just to add to that, <laughs> totally agree. <laughs> just to, I completely agree. And to add to that, I. I led a program during the pandemic at NHS Test and Trace, and it was at the time where we'd run out of PCR tests, really. There was impossible to get hold of any across the planet. And so we set up five programs to go and find new technologies and roll them out. And the difference between then and now and then and before was exactly as Jack says. We managed to just cut through that and, and, and get those adopted. And to me, it comes down to what Chris said, product market fit, but then really understanding in the health system, which is the specific part of it and how does it operate? How does the money flow? How do the people work and how do they adopt things? When I've seen things work well, um, an example is AcuraX uh, during the pandemic, absolutely catapulted to being in kind of over 90% of GP practices because they had a viral mechanism of having GPs refer other GPs and GPs autonomously control decisions about what technology they were using. And in that particular space, they could, you know, accelerate the adoption. So, yeah. Well, um, I have a whole bunch more questions, but there's no time, um, I'm afraid, to ask them. I'd like you to uh, ask you all, please, could you put your hands together and give a really warm thank you to our panel? <laughs>